There we go. Okay, nothing lost. It's just a good thing I checked. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, Logisim. maximize this just so that it's easier to read and I might need to just resize the screen a little bit auto setup no all right so the first thing we need to do is to create the and for setup okay I understand that you know when you look at gates you can actually make an and gate that has four inputs but that's that, that defeats the whole purpose of today's lecture or the, the lab portion so what I'll do is I'm going to go to project and say add circuit. So the circuit I'm adding is AND4. AND2 is a basic design, you know, I'm not going to do it. But AND4 is a intermediate composite you know, um, circuit. And I'll just go ahead and make a new circuit like that. To you, you have to add two levels of intermediate circuits. The first one is the half adder. The second one is the full adder because your finished product is a 4-bit adder making use of full, ad full adders and in my case you know it's just only one level yep why are you starting in the, in the middle huh um, because and 2 is already done so I don't need to do the and 2 well I can do that too if you want to let's go ahead and start with and 2 so this will have the same number of levels of ab abstraction so and 2 is pretty easy so now you can see that you know, there's a magnifying glass with N2, that means this is what I'm editing at this point. So N2 obviously only has two input gates or input pins. Okay, let me just magnify this. Um, it has a conjunction gate, so we'll go to conjunction, go to gates, pull a conjunction out of it, and change the number of inputs to two, and turn it into a narrow design, like so. <coughs> And we'll have one single output pin like so. So I'm just need I just need to make the connection here. And for drawing a line, it's drag and drop. Okay, you drag from the beginning where it is connecting from, and then you drop where it's connecting to. So I'm done with uh, the N2 component, like this one. It's all done. So now I can right click on the component itself and say Edit Circuit Appearance. Okay, so this is a chance for me to add, you know, captions and whatnot. So what I'll do is I'm going to say, okay, this is, this has a name. It is an AND2 component. And you can align everything so it looks good. Um, and it has two inputs, so I will label those as well. So I'm going to use this one to say IN0, IN1. And this is going to be the output, so we just say out. And once again, I'm just going to realign things so it looks nice. Yep, go ahead. How did you get it to that condensed version again? Say again? How did you get it to that condensed version? Right click, oh. <coughs> right, cl right click on the component and uh, click Edit Circuit Appearance. Okay. All right, so you know, this is okay, this is sufficient. Now for those of you who are, you who have an inner artist, okay, you can basically say, oh, this really sucks. I don't like this design at all. So what you can do is to take out the, the, the square and you know, redesign the whole thing and make it look like the shape that you want, okay? But I'm not gonna spend too much time on that one. This is the component that I wanna make and that's it, okay? And don't forget to save your file occasionally, okay? So I'm just gonna save this as a N8, okay, because uh, Logisim is known to crash occasionally, not frequently, okay? It's better and more stable than most of the other tools that I have used of this nature, but it does crash, so you gotta remember to save your files occasionally. So with the AND2 done, I'm gonna move on to the AND4. Once again, AND4 is a new circuit, so I will go to Project, click Add Circuit. And this time it is named AND4, and what it's going to have will be to use 2 and 2. But you can also see at this point, and 2 is now a component that you can pick from. <coughs> okay, right here. So now you can say, I want 
two and two components. So you pick, you click on it, and then you, your cursor will automatically pick up the tool. So we have one and two of the and two gates, or the and two components. Do we have any questions about this part? How to make use of a component, a circuit that you have done previously? No questions? Okay. So now I have to make the pins. The pins are very important. The pins are equivalent to parameters of functions. Okay. So you need to make sure that you have you know, sufficient pins to give it information to process. But you also need to have an output pin here, which is kind of like the output pin of um, kind of like a return value. But in here, I also need another, well, I, I, I just lied. I need three of the N2 gates to get this working. There we go. And move this one up. So now all is left to do, all that is left to do is to draw the connections. So once again, drawing the connections means you know hover over a point until it changes the icon to have a circle, and then just drag it to the place that it needs to go. And if you, yeah, there we go. There. Ah, here we go. And do the same thing with the other one. Uh, the usual things of uh, the usual actions of copy and paste, they will also work in Logic Sim, which is kind of handy. Do you guys have any questions back there? No? Okay. All right. So let's not uh, talk back there so the other students can listen to me. Okay. So now we have to hook up the two outputs of the two, the first two and two gates into the second and two gates, and two gate, the third one, excuse me. And then the output of that one goes to the final output. Now, this is a sub-circuit, but you can test it also, okay? With every sub-circuit, you can also test by changing to the simulation mode, and you can see it will only turn the output into a 1 when all the inputs are 1. If any of the input is a 0, the output is a 0, which is what it's supposed to do. So we are now done with the second level of uh, circuit component. Are there any questions? <coughs> No questions. All right. Oh, do you want us on our homework to like label those inputs just A and B, A and B, A and B? Uh, you need to label the inputs as the final design needs to label from A three to A zero, B three to B zero, and then D three to D zero. <coughs> okay. But that's only for the pins. Okay, you're labeling the pins, not the uh, sub circuit itself. You mean not the N two gate? Right. So now with the N4 gate, I can right click on it and I can now say edit circuit appearance. So now it looks like this because you know that kind of resembles you know what we saw earlier because we have four input pins from the left and one output pin on the right. Um, so once again, if you feel like you know doing some fancy work here, you can go ahead and label the entire design. This is an N4. And then you can also label you know the inputs here. N0 in one, in two, in three, and this is the output. Now these labelings you know, can be helpful, you know, if you are making use of your own design, sometimes you will forget, okay, which one is which one. So this will kind of keep you, eh, it's a little bit harder to do it this way. Okay, let's go ahead and make this longer. So this way I can separate the pins a little bit better. If uh, Art New Media come, walks in here right now, they will probably be not like me because they think I'm designing, I'm teaching people how to design stuff. <laughs> it's not, okay, there we go. So this is what you can do too. You can spend all day long, you know, making the design look just right and make it the right color and stuff like that. Okay, I just move it so that we you know, I can have space for the labels. That's all. That's the only reason why I'm doing it. Okay, you can also spend all day to align the labels so they all line up nice and you know easy to read. I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so now we have an N4 component all done here. And then the next thing we need to do is to make the AND8, the final product. 
The final product can be the main, so I don't need to make another circuit anymore. It's just a main circuit itself. And it's going to make use of two and four sub circuits. So I will pick one and four, two here, and then one and two, you know, basically to merge the output of these two and four components. And now I just need to replicate the, uh, the, the pins. So to replicate really quickly, you can click on one, control C to copy, and then paste, paste, paste. Oh, okay. Oh, this way, okay, now that I have four, I can select the entire group of four, control C, control V, so I can now replicate, you know, like four pins in a row. So all the usual tricks of copy paste, you know, works as well <coughs> in this tool. And that can come in handy. Can save you some time. There we go. And it's time to draw the connect. Oh, we have one output pin here. And that's the output pin. So it's really just time for me. Um, the entire thing is off by one. See, even I sometimes you know cannot stand this kind of a misalignment. So I will go ahead and fix it. Group the four. Move it down a little bit. Now we can make the connections. Now, if you really want to save time, you want to finish like one of these and four gates, and then just replicate the entire thing. That will replicate all the input pins the component itself and all the connections. So if you really want to optimize the process, you know, you can certainly do that. And why did you put the N2 gate in there? Because... Just to connect the two outputs? Yes. Because they need to be connected as well. Yay, I'm done. <laughs> okay. So that's kind of what you need to do, ex with except in your case, okay, you also need to label all the pins. So I know which pin is which pin, which is not too hard. You click on one of these pins, and then you just go to label, and you say this is, um, you know, you can use, well, I'm going to use A, B, C, D, you know, and so on, but you will have to use you know, what is described in the homework assignment. So this is B, and so on. And then this one is basically just the output. So I would say, you know, this is a R for result. Okay. So that's kind of what you need to do for your homework assignment. Except you are dealing with a half adder and a full adder, and then a four bit adder being the final product. I'm just dealing with some really easy stuff. <coughs> it still illustrates how to use the tool. Are there any questions? Since the initial carry is zero, do we have, is there anything special? Ah, very good. Good question. Okay. So since the initial one is a zero, what you can do is you go to, if I remember correctly, wiring. Um, you can use a constant. So a constant is basically just a value. You can hook it up to a pin. So let's say I'm dealing with an AND7. Okay. If I'm dealing with an AND7, what I can do is to get rid of this pin here, and instead I just connect a constant of one to this pin. Now, but in your case, you don't want a one, you want a zero. So what you do is you click on the constant here and just change the value from one to zero. Then you have your zero as the input to the first, to the carry <coughs> of carry in of the least significant bit. Are there any questions about how to put a constant into your design? If we just label it C zero, would it still be the same, or do you want it to be zero? No, the value itself is zero. Okay. Yeah, because I don't want you to make a special case of you know this is the first full adder and it looks different from the other adders, because that's just going to be more work to you. So instead, you make a very general purpose full adder that has a input carry. It's just that you know when you are making your four bit adder, the least com the least significant adder is going to have an input of zero as its carry. Is that does that mm -hmm. does that answer your question? Okay. All right.
Are there any other questions about this particular homework assignment? No questions? Well, since you do not have any questions about the homework assignment, I am going to assign the due date to it, which is one week from today. Does it already have one week from today, the 4-bit uh, adder? No, this is the 4-bit adder. Oh, okay. So the 4-bit adder, if I... It has an 8th... Oh, okay, it does have a due date already, but the time is wrong. And someone has turned it in already. Hello. <laughs> Good job. So I will change the due, t the due t time to... Uh, the start time of this class, which is 9 o'clock. That's the only thing I'm changing. All right, so you have one week to turn this one in. The subtractor, I'm going to assign it on Thursday, but it's basically about the same thing. All right, any other questions? Has anyone clicked on that you know, tax processor thing and taken a look already at this point? Where is that at? Um, it's a little bit further into the class. Let me see. It's in maybe control unit. Let me see. Yeah, text processor with microcode. Yeah. So that's the uh, that's the one. The very first thing. Oh, right. Yep. So that's a that's a. Interesting thing, you know, this is a file that you open up in Logisim. Let me just kind of show you, because it's kind of fun. So if you click on this one, it's, it will t decompress it because it's a it's a folder by itself. So let me just kind of save it into my folder. I have one already saved, so it's called tax processor with parentheses one. So when you decompress it, it will create a subfolder called tax processor. That's because you know, it's not just the circuit itself, it also needs to have the microcode ROM in order to function. So that's why we have a mcc.rom file that you need to load into the design in order for it to work. But for today, what I'm gonna do is to show you what it looks like because then it will give you an idea of you know what where we are heading with all this stuff. So file open downloads tax processor and tax processor. Okay, there we go. This is the design. Um, that's basically a very very simplistic processor. It can only do very simple stuff. Okay, like execute the add instruction, the subtract instruction, stuff like that. But it also has all the necessary components like registers, a memory bus, the memory itself in RAM, uh, the microcode engine, which is this portion here. So it has all the vital components of a processor. Um, so everything is easy to see because if you see a particular component, let me just zoom into one, and that really kind of helps to um, emphasize what we are doing today or the importance of what we are doing today. If you look at just this component here, it is a register bank, okay? So what is in the register bank? You just need to double click it, okay? If you double click on this component, or maybe not, <laughs> right click, show attributes, view registers, there we go. So if you right click and then click view registers, it will show you the registers as, you know, basically ex ex as an exploded diagram. and this is the actual inside of that one block. So in other words, when you look at a, blo a single block in the overall design, it's almost like a function call, and then this is the body of the function. This is the actual definition of the function itself. By doing this, we can complete, we can actually handle fairly large and complex design, but by using multiple layers of abstraction, the actual overall design can be simplified. It doesn't look, it doesn't look really busy. So all of this stuff, you know, we'll get to all of this stuff here, and you guys will be making some modifications. I have no idea why this is 
you know, it keeps you know, doing the auto setup thing, which is kind of distracting. Uh, but this is what we'll be doing, okay? So we're heading in this direction of designing and making our own processor and actually get to see how instructions are executed inside a processor. Everything is going to be simulated. It's a very simple four-bit uh, processor, but nonetheless, it illustrates the concepts. If you guys are transferring to UC Berkeley, to Cal, okay, um, the final year project, if I still remember correctly, is you have to design a RISC processor. It's a, going to be a 32-bit processor, not a little tiny 4-bit you know, processor, with all kinds of features like pipelining and whatnot. So this is kind of like a baby project compared to that one, but it kind of shows you the, the principle of how to design a processor, how to work with simple tools like this. All right, are there any questions? No questions, okay. So do you guys see there are like two parallel paths right now? On one path, we're dealing with logic gates, you know, adders, uh, processor design and stuff like that. On the other path, we're talking about, you know, uh, messed up, you know, C programs, okay? So those two paths will merge at some point. Okay, they will merge by the time we start to do assembly language programming. Okay, because I want you guys to see what is actually inside the processor. Okay, okay, what does an instruction look like? How does it work? Okay, how does a processor get an instruction and know what to do with it? This will show you, you know, what a processor is going to do with an instruction. So once this is all done, then we'll actually start to write, you know, uh, I three eighty six instructions. You know, that will actually run on an Intel processor. So they will merge, you know, things are all related. It's just that at this time, it might seem a little fragmented. All right, any questions? Are there any questions about the material that we have talked about, the stuff that I have demonstrated, and so on? Yep. So the four-bit subtractor is not do the same as the adder and the logisim? That is correct. That the, the subtractor is technically not assigned yet, so I will give you a, a due date when it is assigned. But if you feel like working on it, go ahead. You know, it's not really that much more difficult compared to a uh, to an adder. Okay, I take it back. I just lied. The subtractor is easier. <laughs> the subtractor turns out to be easier. There are fewer components in a half subtractor than a half adder. If you look at the equations, you will understand why. All right. Any other questions when I'm you, still recording? Yep. Where did you add the constant from? I can't find it. Huh? Where did you add the constant from on the other? The constant, uh, okay, the constant comes in as a pin. Oh, okay. So when you go to, wiring. let's see, when you go to pins, okay, let me magnify this first. It is under. Oh, you already have it up. It's yeah, up. it's constant right here. It's under wiring. Okay. You're right. Okay, it's under wiring as constant. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If there are no questions, I am going to stop the recorder. Well, one more thing. Just one more thing because I want to show you, you know, why you might actually end up writing programs in assembly language, okay? Because most people think there's no place to write programs in assembly anymore because we have enough processing power, enough RAM, so everything should at least, you know, be able to use C and C++. That is not entirely the case. So I'm gonna go to DigiKey, which is a really cool website if you're really into electronics and making your own stuff. This is really a good website, <clears throat> but I will focus on what I'm supposed to do here, which is to look up an uh, AT Tiny part. AT Tiny is a product line um, of microcontroller chips. <coughs> now, remember what a microcontroller is. A microcontroller is a computer on a chip. It contains the processor, it contains the RAM, it contains the flash ROM to hold the instructions, and it even contains simple input-output devices. Um, you may not, you, need, you do not need to remember these things. You know, the, it will include like ADAX and DAX. ADAX is analog to digital converter, and then the other one, DAC, is digital to analog converter. 
So I'm going to go to embedded processors here, and there are 1044, 1,444 products here. So I will further limit my search based on these parameters. So the parameters I'm going to pick, and you can also see the supply voltage. In other words, most of many of these components can run from 1.7 volts to 5.5 volts. Okay, what is the voltage of one single uh, nickel metal hydride rechargeable battery? 3.7. Uh, that's a lithium ion. NIMH. 4.2. 1.2. So that so 1.2 is the nominal output voltage of a nickel metal hydride battery. Okay, usual rechargeable battery. You only need two cells in series to power up one of these processors. Okay. And you can, the other part that is kind of interesting would be over here, RAM size. Okay, how much RAM do we have in one of these microcontroller units? What does it mean, 32 by 8? It means 32 times 8 bits, 32 bytes. That's all you have. Okay, so I'm going to pick one of these things as a as a search criterion, and EE prom size, you know, that's for storing uh, calibration constants. So I'm going to pick one and then click Apply Filters, and see what I get here. Because you know, I I think the most common question right now is why do I want to pick a processor with only 32 bytes of RAM? Okay, there are much better processors out there. First reason is the size, SOT23, SOT23, small outline, cannot remember the T. Does anyone remember the T, what the T stands for? Small outline, it's a surface mount part, okay? If you just look at uh, the size of your pinky's fingernail, okay? You can imagine that will easily fit eight, maybe more of these chips. Okay, and they're not even considered really small. Okay, these are the ones that I can solder by hand. The other one would be more difficult to solder by hand. These are tiny, tiny little ones. They have to be done by machines. Okay, but the main reason why I'm looking at this one is because of the price. Look at the unit price, which is this column here. Okay, if I buy 4,500 at a time, each one is 38 cents. And that's an MCU. It's a it's a microcontroller unit. It's 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 self sufficient. Okay. All you have to do is to give it power, and it will it, it, and program it, and it will work. Are we doing okay so far with this concept here? Less than forty cents. How much is a cup of Starbucks? Five bucks. Five bucks. Okay. So when you buy one Starbucks, you can think you know. Well, I could have bought 12 of these processors. <laughs> okay, that's how cheap it is. Why do you think that becomes a factor? Because you need a lot of them. Okay, so what do you want to put it into? Let's click on one and find out what it can do. Okay, so we'll click on the first one. Uh, this is the packaging, you know, it's really small. Okay, this is, um, and we'll look at the data sheet. Oh, that's just a summary, but it's it's good. Summary is good. <clears throat> okay, so we'll we'll take a look at these things here. You know, I it, you won't be quizzed on these things, but I think it is kind of interesting in certain ways. It has fifty-four powerful instructions. There are only fifty-four instructions. Fifty-four instructions to choose from. You know, for each instruction place, there are only fifty-four. So it's a risk architecture or reduced instruction set computer. We have 16 general purpose work reg uh, work registers, and it can run up to 12 MIPS, 12 million instructions per second. And you guys are gonna sneeze at this and go like, <laughs> sneer at this one and go like, 12 million instructions per second? I got my Pentium running at gigahertz, not megahertz. Well, this is already faster than the IBM PC AT computer. Okay. Most people looking at me go like, what is an IBM PC AT? Well, that's the second generation of IBM PC computers, okay? Using a 286 computer. So it does pack a lot of processing power already. Um, it has got 
512 or 1024 bytes of program flash memory. So this is where your program is stored. So this means the largest program you can write that can store on this little device is half a kilobyte. Okay, imagine that, okay? We are looking at, okay, how much disk space do you need to install Adobe Creative Suite, the latest one? Two gigabytes or something like that? This is half a kilobyte. We are off by a lot, okay, you know? <laughs> Alrighty. What about power consumption? How much power does it need? Active mode is 200 microamp. What is, what is a microamp? It is a millionth of an ampere. Okay? So, how do I know how long, you know, like two AA um, rechargeable batteries will last? Well, you do the calculations. What is the capacity of a um, regular, typical metal hydride AA cell? Come on, you guys should know this stuff. I mean, I know you guys go to fries and shop, okay? <laughs> so, you know, 2,000 milliamp hour. That's how we rate the capacity of rechargeable batteries. And milliamp hour means if it is consuming 2,000 milliamp, it will last one hour. Okay, so one states the duration, the other one states, okay, at what type of current draw, okay? So if you divide this number by the current draw of this little processor, which is 200 microamp, that will give you the amount of time that two AA cells can power up this thing continuously, running at full speed, okay? <coughs> what is this number? You go like, eh, maybe 10 or so. No, we are off by a thousand. So we're looking at 10,000 hours. What is 10,000 hours? How many hours do we have in a day? 24, a week has 168. Okay, so 10,000 is how many days? We'll just call it a lot. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions about this? But why, why do you, what type of application would use a simple processor that runs on like two AA cells, but it can keep running for many, many days? What type of application do we have here? And the processor itself is dirt cheap also, which means you can put it into inexpensive products to begin with. Okay, come on, you guys should to be able to come up with some applications. Digital watch. Digital watch, well, digital watch components are even more specialized, so they're actually even less expensive. But the, the, the point about this one is it is programmable, okay? Even though you only have 512 bytes to store the program, and there are only 54 instructions available, it is still programmable. You just have to program it in assembly language, okay? But it is already, it has enough stuff, enough logic to deal with a lot of stuff. Toys? Toys, yep, all kinds of toys. Okay, can someone name a particular toy that can be, that can use a processor? Cell phone. Mm -hmm. Cell phone. Cell phone? That's yeah. not a toy, that's a, that's a, that's a tool. That's my computer. It's my computer pretending to be a phone. That's what the cell phone. Come on, you guys can think of something. I mean, how about toothbrush? That's not a toy, that's a tool. It is not a toy, that is true. Okay, yeah. Okay, so a tool, okay? A, a toothbrush, okay? So why would I put a, a, two batteries and a processor into a toothbrush? Because it's, a motor, it's an electric toothbrush. It doesn't have to be electric, okay? You know, you can actually put a motion sensor into it and a motion sensor is very inexpensive. It's a, it's a chip also, about the same size as the processor. So you can basically put all of that stuff into a toothbrush, okay? And it doesn't have to be electric either, okay? Um, it's, it just needs a timer, okay? So it has a beeper or a little vibration motor thingy. So, you know, when a kid picks it up, it will start the timer, and then every 30 seconds, it will give you a buzz, and then after two minutes, it will give you a long buzz to say, okay, you're done today. Right there, okay? There's an application. 
So I can even count the components that you need for a toothbrush like that. So you need a regular toothbrush. You need uh, what we call an accelerometer, a solid state chip that can detect motion. Um, a processor like this one. Um, the motor, you know, the vibration motor thing, okay, LEDs, and the batteries. And I can already tell you which components are the cheapest of the entire thing. This guy. The processor, the computer, is going to be the cheapest component of the entire thing. The motor is going to cost more. The batteries will cost more. Even the LED may cost close to the cost of the processor. Because you want a high brightness type, you know, those are not cheap. Okay. That gives you an idea of you know, why do I want to learn programming in assembly? Because in certain applications, people need to go for processors that are very inexpensive, 40 cents, okay? Do you think, okay, let's say Colgate wants to get into this whole bandwagon of, you know, inexpensive, you know, toothbrush that has a sensor to remind kids, you know, that they, they need to brush, like, you know, up to a certain amount of time. Do you think Colgate is gonna make 4,500 toothbrush Toothbrushes? No. That's not the order of magnitude, right? Colgate's going to make how many? Millions. Millions, right. So when Colgate go to Atma, which is the manufacturer of this chip, and say, well, you know, we need to order like four million of these chips, what kind of price do you think they will be getting? It will be maybe half the price that we are seeing here. So instead of 40 cents, maybe 20 cents. Okay? But the bottom line is, you can only use it if you know how to program in assembly, not in C, okay? And with 512 bytes, you can make your toothbrush pretty intelligent. In other words, you can make it keep track of the brushing habit, okay? When it's almost time for the kid to brush, you can actually time it on a daily basis. It can start vibrating on its own stand. It's like, come on, pay attention to me, it's time to brush. And it can learn that pattern over time. <laughs> or the next time that the kid picks it up and the kid, kid has not brushed teeth for you know, like two days or something like that, you can give a long beep you know, to basically say, hey, warning, okay, you have not brushed your teeth for two days. If you don't mind you know, this thing getting more and more expensive, you can put in some wireless component, like a Bluetooth chip onto it. <laughs> So the Bluetooth chip can talk to mom's cell phone. So mom knows, hey, Joey, uh, my phone is showing that you haven't brushed for two days. <laughs> uh huh? Yep. And that becomes all possible. OK, you go to a mechanics shop, OK? Car you know, repair shop, torque wrench, OK? A wrench is a wrench. It's a wrench, right? You know, what does, what does it have anything to do with this? What is a torque wrench? Why do we need a torque wrench? To see how far we should screw on the... Uh, how much torque to apply to nuts, bolts, and whatnot, yeah. right? But why do, we know, why do we need to know how much torque we have to apply? What happens when your wheel lug nuts are not sufficiently torqued? They will fall off when you're driving on the highway. Is that a good thing? No, okay? What happens when you torque it too much? And it will strip it, right? Okay? Not a good thing either. So you want to torque it to just the right amount. Okay? But we do have torque wrenches. So how can we put something like this into a torque wrench? Why would somebody why would a mechanic buy a smart torque wrench? How smart can it get? Well, it could be a digital output. So you so you can visualize. Okay, a digital readout. Okay. A digital readout is good, except you know, in a shop it's usually pretty dirty. So the screen is going to be covered with oil and junk and whatnot. Okay. So an audible. You can make it audible. Okay, that's for sure. Okay. How do you program how much torque is the set point? Oh, we can put a little num. We, we can put a little num pad next to the uh, on the torque wrench itself. No, that will get destroyed in two minutes. Okay, not a good idea. What do we do? Program. We make the torque wrench completely indestructible by doing it by do Bluetooth. So the thing is rechargeable using the magnetic field thing, and it communicates by Bluetooth. So now you put, you, you buy a torque wrench, there's nothing to open up, there are no buttons on it, there are no displays on it. 
If you want to program it, you use a cell phone or a computer that is Bluetooth you know, capable. So now you also tie this into um, car repair software because car repair software will tell you what is the size of the nut or bolt or whatever, and it will tell you how much torque to apply as well. You just click a button there, and then it will send that data into the torque wrench. The torque wrench is now programmed for that particular nut. And you can even log it. If you're training a trainee to do all kinds of repair work, you can actually lo log how much torque was actually applied. So later on, you can review all that stuff and tell your apprentice and go like, well, you know, with this particular boat here, you did not torque it sufficiently, okay? Or this one, you need to torque it a little bit more, and so on. Are you guys kind of seeing the, the possibilities because of these inexpensive processors? I mean, surely you can do that with an expensive processor, but then your torque range would have to be ex ex a lot more expensive. But with a 40 cents, 30 cents, 20 cents of your processor, it doesn't really add that much to the cost of the torque wrench itself. But it does open up all kinds of possibilities, including having someone to hack your torque wrench. <laughs> your torque wrench has thus been hacked. Well, those <coughs> torque wrenches, I just looked, is like anywhere from 500 to $1,600. Oh, if you go for snap-ons, those are expensive to begin with. Yeah. yeah. So tagging on to the electronics and whatnot is not <coughs> increasing that cost a whole lot. Alrighty, so you know it's not science fiction. By the way, there are torque wrenches that are already computerized. Yep, it's just a matter of time before screwdrivers. You go to Walmart, you buy a screwdriver. Guess what? You alone. <laughs> <laughs> it's automated. <laughs> no, not automated, but it's smart. Okay, you can communicate with your Bluetooth cell phone, and then you can set the the amount of torque and so on and so forth. It, those days are coming. You might think I'm crazy, okay? You know, but those days are coming. In year 2000, I tell people to use Linux, and they tell me that I'm crazy. But they still say I'm crazy sometimes. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that's the end of today's lecture. I'm, I'm all done here. So, any more questions? Is anyone even remotely interested in this kind of stuff? Yeah, I was wondering <coughs> if the internal calibrated oscillator. Yeah. What? Which one? In the, in the special microcontroller features, the last thing, the internal one. calibrated oscillator. Above IOPAC, right there. Okay, so what that means is the um, all kinds of processors need what we call a clock in order to operate. And in a lot of processes, the clock is not very exact, okay? So it will rate it as 16 megahertz, but it can be plus or minus like 2%, which also means if you try to use it to keep track of time, it's not a very good idea. This one means it is internally, it's calibrated, which means it is very high precision, and it's internal. You don't need an extra component as an oscillator, which is common to many other types of microcontroller units. You need a separate component electronic component to be the oscillator. This one is built in, it's internal to the chip itself. Is that small chip? Yes. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very tiny little chip. If you just want to get an idea of how tiny is tiny, we will look at the dimensions. Uh, scroll, 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 scroll. I, I just want to find the packaging information on this one. May not be on this slide, maybe on the actual data sheet. Some people like reading novels and stuff like that. You know, reading these this kind of data sheet is my was my hobby. Oh, packaging information, I just saw that. Packaging information. Here. Okay, there we go. So this is an exploded or magnified diagram of the chip itself. And these units are in millimeters. Okay, so we can look at the, the dimension. We want to look at E and D because that's the overall dimension, how much space it's going to take up on the circuit board. So D and E are respectively 2.8 and 2.6 millimeters. 
So we are looking at a three by three millimeter square, more or less, and that's how much uh, space it will take up on the circuit board. I would say that's pretty small, especially considering all the components that are built into the chip already. <coughs> this thing can also sense temperature, by the way. It has got an ADAC or analog to digital converter, which means you can actually sense temperature. It can tell you know, the variation of temperature. And all kinds of stuff. All right. Well, any other questions? No questions. If the computer club is interested in doing some projects with this, you know, I can kind of show you guys how to get it started too. What about flying drones? Who cares about toothbrush? I have never brushed my teeth. What about flying drones? I would much rather, much rather spend my time flying drones than brushing my teeth. So what about drones? If you, want to, if you want to make a drone autonomous, you need a processor, right? You need a computer to read off the GPS information and stuff like that. So how much processing power do you think you need to make a, a drone autonomous? And how much do you have to pay for that processor? How about five bucks? Well, yeah, five bucks, you know, four, four or five bucks. That will get you the older brother or the big, big brother of this particular chip is the AT Mega instead of the AT Tiny. It's the AT Mega line of microcontroller units. It is about four or five bucks. And it already has enough uh, program space to store a fairly complex program to even automate <coughs> um, drones. Yep. And that one is C programmable. It has enough resources to write C programs. So this is an interesting area. You know, it's a very niche and specialized programming, but I think it does open up a lot of possibilities. All right. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, I will stop the recorder and let you guys have lunch.